OK, thanks very much. Uh, so this talk is a hodgepodge of old ideas and some new ideas. So there might be some slides which are excessively technical for most of you. So you can ignore them, and maybe after that, there would be, again, some basic ideas that you could follow. Uh, so specifically, there will be com some comments for experts about supersymmetric quantum filters, which you may feel free to ignore if you are not an expert. <clears throat> so a quantum filter is a certain uh, framework for physics. Uh, and this, this framework uh, arises in many, many branches of physics. So it's very commonplace. Uh, people who do statistical physics, condensed matter physics, stochastic processes, and especially elementar elementary particle physics, uh, they have to deal with quantum field theory on a daily basis. So it's a certain physical framework, but somewhat historically, unprecedentedly, it's still not rigorously defined. Uh, in, in many cases in the past, when physicists came up with some framework to describe nature, it may have taken some time to make it completely well defined. But in this particular case, I think it's unprecedentedly long. So people have been struggling for many, many decades with trying to make sense of it mathematically. But it's still, but it's still kind of open. And that, that, that may, may be uh, the mathematicians to blame, but it most more likely us to blame that we don't have the right language to tell the mathematicians what they should be trying to define. So it's a certain framework that's extremely successful for physics, but still lacks a rigorous definition, and we're still exploring what it can contain or explain. Also, if there are any questions, please stop me. That would make the talk a little bit more interactive. So there are many possible uh, realizations of quantum field theory. Uh, I mentioned that some of them arise in different branches of physics, and they may be in different dimensions, and they may be describing different different types of phenomena. And it's of interest to understand how they are related to each other and what is the totality of the space of models. So there is some, in quantum mechanics, for example, we have a pretty good understanding of what it means to study general quantum mechanical systems. But in quantum field theory, the space is very big, and we don't understand uh, its intricacies. So one way to think about it is, given a quantum filter, you can try to explore those quantum filters that are nearby. So what you could do is you could start from some quantum filter and then deform it a little bit. So mathematically, we start from a given model, and then we deform it by adding some operators. These are like uh, Hermitian operators with some coefficients, gi. So we add to the defining theory some uh, additional operators with some coefficients, <coughs> coefficients gi, and these coefficients gi parameterize the local space of models. So if that were the story, that would be somewhat, uh, somewhat simple, but the most fundamental discovery in the field is that while you are trying to explore this nearby space of possible models, in fact, these numbers are not numbers. So they start off as being numbers when you describe what you're trying to do. But then you think about it a little bit more. And it turns out that these numbers, which are supposed to characterize the nearby quantum field theories, are not actually numbers. So they are fundamentally objects that depend on the resolution of the experiment. And this is the most fundamental, fundamentally confusing fact about quantum field theories, that these numbers are in fact not numbers, and they may take different values depending on the resolution of the experiment that you're using to probe these theories. So somebody might say that this number is equal to 10. Somebody else might say that it's equal to 100. But there might not be a contradiction, because they're looking at the experiment from different, with different resolutions or different microscopes. So this is the most fundamentally confusing fact about quantum filters, and that's the main reason that it's hard to define mathematically. If not for that, I believe the problem would have been much easier. So uh, we started from deforming the theory by some given set of local Hermitian operators with some coefficients gi, which turned out to be not numbers, but objects that depend on the resolution. And then there is a fundamental equation which says the following thing, that if you change the resolution of the microscope, so you can ignore the equation. I'll tell you what it means in words. All this means is that if you change the resolution of the microscope by some little amount, then you can adjust these numbers a little bit so that you would get uh, the same kind of underlying theory. 
So this num this, these numbers that you started from are not numbers. They depend on the resolution. And this equation tells you how they depend on the resolution. So there are some objects that appear in these equations which are called beta functions. So they are denoted here by beta. And these beta functions tell you how you should move in the space of parameters when you change the resolution of the microscope. So mathematically, you can think about them as vector fields in the space of theories. So when you change the resolution, you move a little bit in the space of theories in, in a way that's dictated by some vector field, which is called beta. And you could view the task of a physicist or a person who is studying quantum field theory as computing these vector fields. So if you were to compute these vector fields, you could know how changing the resolution changes the system. And that would be a partial solution of the, a partial solution of the theory. Okay, so you could imagine that that's what people should be doing to compute these vector fields. Now, there are three cases, roughly speaking. They're not really mutually disjoined. There could be cases in which uh, they're intertwined. But very roughly speaking, if these functions beta are positive, then what happens is that these numbers that you added, these numbers gi, as you, increase the res as you decrease the resolution of the microscope and you go to longer and longer and longer distances, or weaker and weaker and weaker microscopes, then what would happen is that this GI would disappear. So the vector field is such that this GI decreases to zero. And then you could forget about it. So that's what happens if beta is positive. If beta is negative, then the opposite happens. As you go to longer and longer distances, then these couplings increase forever. And once this coupling increases, it means that you're getting farther and farther and farther from the starting point. The starting point is when all these numbers GI vanish. So if beta, is if beta is negative, it means that as you make measurements in this system with longer and longer distances, then this theory gets farther and farther away from the starting point. And generally, it's very hard to predict where it would end up. And then there is a very peculiar case that I will I'll emphasize a little bit in this talk because it's of great interest to mathematicians. So where most of the contact between quantum field theory and mathematics was made so far is in this particular case, which is non-generic. And that's the, the case where beta is exactly vanishing. When beta is exactly vanishing, this is the case that you don't, have, you, need, you don't need to worry about the fact that changing the microscope's resolution would change the value of g, because g is just a number. So it's a genuine number. It doesn't depend on the resolution. It's a fixed number. And it's easier to handle mathematically with such situations. It's extremely rare. It's extremely rare and non-generic. But there are some cases in which it arises, and these cases made a lot of impact on mathematics and vice versa. So I'll be discussing all these cases with some examples. Uh, and some of the comments will be very basic. Some would be probably incomprehensible to most, but still. Are there any questions about uh, this part of the introduction? So let's start discussing this case where these couplings are what people call exactly marginal, namely that beta vanishes. So they don't depend on the resolution of the microscope. If these couplings don't depend on the resolution of the microscope, then the, symmetry, then the, system, the system that has these couplings has a higher symmetry. And the reason is that all the scales, at all scales, it doesn't matter which microscopes you use, at all scales, the system looks the same. So the couplings don't change as a function of the scale. And therefore, the system has a scaling symmetry. And so the, the symmetry of the system is enhanced, in addition to the usual rotations and translations, into a scaling symmetry, which is ultimately enhanced to a bigger group, which contains scaling, translations, rotations, and uh, some other transformations. And these cases we call conformal field theories. They describe critical phenomena in second-order phase transitions for statistical physicists. They appear in condensed matter physics as quantum phase transitions. Uh, and they appear in particle physics in many different ways that I'll explain. OK, so conformal filters are these cases in which these couplings are genuine numbers that don't depend on the scale, and we have a higher symmetry. Zara, you very cleverly are defining quantum filters and turning around. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that one exists, and then I'm exploring the vicinity. You're assuming that you're, presumably in this case, since you're perturbing the marginal operator around something, yes. that you're assuming exists. Yes. Is a right. Theory. Yes. That's right. I'm assuming that at least one such theory exists, and I'm trying to perturb around it. Uh, I'm not trying to make. I'm not trying to claim that I have any. That I've made any progress towards defining mathematically what quantum field theory is. I'm just trying uh, to explain where contact with mathematics and physics 
can, can appear. So in this particular case of conformal filters, there are lots of applications in various branches of physics, even in turbulence. Uh, and those cases arise when there are couplings that don't depend on the resolution. So the general paradigm is that this, the, as you change the resolution, couplings evolve in some way. So you have like a phase diagram. So you can suppose the system has two couplings, G1 and G2, corresponding to two deformation directions, O1 and O2. And as you change the resolution, starting from some point, this is the starting point that I assume exists. And as you change the resolution, starting from some point, you can go in various directions. So for example, here you could go up, or there could be a point in the middle in which these couplings freeze. They don't depend on the resolution anymore, and you get some conformal filter. There could be some conformal filter here. So you could have many, you could have a multi-dimensional space of different kinds of evolutions of the couplings. And the job, I mean, of people who study quantum filters is to try to understand these phase diagrams. And they describe different physical, physical problems. Okay. So you should imagine a very high dimensional space in which such flows exist. And this is one like uh, common example that you could start from some relatively simple theory, deform it, then you could go to some new theory which is much more complicated, go elsewhere and then keep going. And so the question is about the totality of the space. How, the, what do we know about the totality of the space? Uh, and this is some things that I'll try to address in this. So not much is known about the space in general, except for, except for some very interesting crude features that I will explain. So I'll try to explain some very interesting crude features. One of these crude features you can already see from this diagram if you look at it carefully. So if you try to come back to any point that you've already departed from, you can never do that. So you can go from here to here to here, or you could possibly go here and here, but there are never lines that bring you back. And I'll try to emphasize that this is uh, a general feature that we believe is true. And then we'll discuss also this case of exactly marginal operators and what do we know about those. Yes? Uh, so yeah, usually, I mean, this is a simplifying assumption. We assume that there are just finitely many directions in which you can depart. Um, now you're asking if this is a theorem or an assumption. So there are counterexamples in two dimensions. Uh, one, uh, one, one can argue that, okay, so since you know the background, I'll answer technically. So in two-dimensional conformal filters, which are non-compact, uh, there are examples where there are infinitely many. In two-dimensional conformal filters, which are compact, you can prove that there are finitely many. And in higher-dimensional conformal filters, you can prove that there are only finitely many, because otherwise you would violate some of the thermodynamic properties of the theory. Yes, we don't have an upper bound. We don't have an upper bound. Uh, there could be finitely many, but an arbitrarily large number. In fact, this is one of the points that there has been very fruitful point connections with mathematics. Because in two-dimensional conformal filters that I'll describe, uh, the number of, for example, relevant marginal perturbations is the same as uh, the Euler characteristic of some Calabi-Yau manifolds. And it's one long-standing problem in mathematics to show that this is bounded from above. From from, from above. <laughs> okay, so we don't know. If you could prove that there are only finitely many and it's bounded by some universal number, that would solve a long standing problem in mathematics. <coughs> so, not much is known about this space except for some very crude features that you can't go back and some other little things that I'll explain. And this has some very important experimental ramifications, but uh, never mind, I'll just try to explain the theory part. So, in the case, where we're studying just exactly marginal deformations of conformal filters, namely those deformations that do not break the conformal symmetry and do not induce some evolution with the scale, there is much more known. And I'll try to explain what's exactly known. However, bear in mind that this case where beta is exactly vanishing takes a miracle. There is no a priori reason why this beta, which is some vector field, would be a degenerate vector field. So it will be exactly vanishing. So for this beta to vanish, you need lots of miracles to happen. Okay, So there are infinitely many equations that you need to satisfy uh, for some deformation of the underlying theory to not induce a dependence on the scale. So you ask yourself, given a deformation of some, of some conformal filter, would it induce some dependence on the microscope scale? And 
if you require that it does not, it results in infinitely many equations. So it's extremely unlikely that you could satisfy these equations. But in fact, it happens experimentally. For example, in the ashkin teller model or in the Lattinger liquid model, which are models that condensed matter theorists have worked on a lot. And they appear also very naturally in string theory and particle physics. Uh, so there are examples in which all of these equations are maybe accidentally satisfied, you could say. And all of these examples are two-dimensional C equals one models. These are examples in which it happens naturally. Uh, but there are also many other examples in which it happens because of a miracle. Okay. So what, what kind of miracle? I'll discuss this kind of miracles that could lead to the satisfaction of all of these equations. But uh, let's start from reminding the case of the Lattinger liquid as an example. So this is a system which is a two-dimensional quantum filter with something that's called C equals 1. This is some central charge which is equal to 1. And there is a deformation of the theory, which does not induce dependence on the scale. This corresponds to changing the radius of some compact boson in two dimensions. So m most of you probably know about that. And you can even make the boson complex. And then you have another parameter, which is called the theta angle. And we understand the geometry that you get. So once you deform around this given point, you have some space of theories. And it's interesting to try to understand the space of conformal field theories that you get by deforming around this initial conformal field theory. And the space of conformal field theories that you get in this way is very interesting. It's the upper half plane divided by some, by some, by some infinite group. And what you get is something that looks like this. Okay, so the space of conformal field theories that you get by deforming around the Lattinger liquid is the upper half plane mod SL to Z, which is what's called in mathematics the fundamental domain. Uh, and it's also the same, it's also equivalent to the space of different tori. So this, and this is the first hint that there could be mathematically interesting, in, in mathematically interesting uh, spaces that arise when you study the totality of the space of quantum field theories. So the space of quantum field theories of the Lattinger liquid is, is something of that sort. This is the most basic example that you could imagine. And you see the emergence of interesting geometry. Now, if one studies other models, in particular models in higher dimensions, not two-dimensional models, but models in other dimensions, it's very rare for them to have these exactly marginal operators that don't evolve with the energy scale. But there are several miracles that can help. One of them is supersymmetry, and the other is infinite n. So if you have some special quantum filters with additional symmetries, there might be such exactly marginal operators. And now I'll give for the experts two examples from the world of supersymmetry. After this slide, I'll give two examples from the world of supersymmetry. Uh, maybe I'll give them now, and then I'll come back. That would be more natural. So one example from the world of supersymmetry are two-dimensional models uh, with what's called 2, 2 supersymmetry. Then the space that you get, the space of quantum filters, is in fact a Kähler manifold. So it's an interesting complex geometry. And if you study, for example, sigma models with Calabi out target spaces, then this space is just the space of uh, complex structure and Kähler structure deformations of the Calabi out. So that's an interesting space. But in fact, there are also examples in four dimensions or three dimensions of exactly marginal deformations in the world of supersymmetry. For example, if you take uh, some uh, n equals 4 theory, which is a famous supersymmetric theory, then there is a three complex dimensional space of exactly marginal deformations. It's a very rich geometry. And we don't understand this three complex dimensional space very well. But the one complex dimensional subspace of it is very well understood. And it again looks like this. So now let me uh, just go back to the non-supersymmetric example. So in principle, this, space of, this is the space of quantum filters. It's, you should think about it as a manifold. And on this manifold, there is a metric. There is a tangent space, and there is a metric that's given, in this, uh, that's given by the overlap of some two operators by some two-point functions. And this metric is a, re is a Riemannian metric on the space of quantum filters. So the space of quantum filters is, in this case at least, a Riemannian manifold with some metric. And you can try to compute this metric. This metric measures distances between quantum filters. And that's the first, um, perhaps, non-trivial thing that in, you know, in these in this diagrams of uh, different theories that evolve in various ways, there is a natural metric. So you can say whether two points are far away or they are close. Okay? There is a natural canonical metric that you can define. And in some cases, we can even compute this metric. Let's go back to this example of the Lattinger liquid. In that case, the metric is exactly known. Okay? It can be exactly computed. It's given by the same metric that Poincaré found for the upper half plane. 
So there are some cases in which these metrics can be exactly computed. Uh, there are some cases in which we, we can characterize the, the space of quantum field theories. And uh, many of these cases are supersymmetric, but not all. So now let me get to the main, uh, to the main tool that I want to introduce. So there are all these interesting uh, questions about the metric in the space of theories, the totality of the space, and the topology of the space. And you need some tool to try to investigate these questions. So what happened in recent years is that an interesting and surprising tool emerged. What is the tool? The tool is that instead of studying quantum filters in flat space, which is what we've, used, we've been used to, do, uh, to doing, we can study quantum filtering on a sphere. Now, studying quantum filter in a sphere leads to surprising results that are extremely powerful. Okay, so what we, st what we do is we start, for example, for, for starters, we'll do also non-conformal filters, but start from a conformal filter in which everything looks the same at all scales and put it on the sphere. That's a natural thing to do for si systems with scale invariance because you can just add a point at infinity. So you put this theory in the sphere and then you can study various questions about quantum field theories on spheres, and that leads to lots of new results, lots of interesting and exciting new results. So from now, what I will be doing is to describe what happens when you study quantum field theories on spheres, and what does it tell us about the totality of the space of quantum field theories. Now, you can ask, what does it mean experimentally to put a quantum field theory on a sphere? How are we ever going to measure experimentally anything about quantum field theories on four-dimensional spheres? So it turns out that you don't have to think about spheres. There is another, another way to think about it through entanglement entropy. So you could, instead of studying the quantum filter in a sphere, if you are not comfortable with doing that, you could instead take quantum filter in flat space, d-dimensional flat space, cut out a little sphere, and try to measure the entanglement between the quantum fluctuations of the vacuum here and quantum fluctuations in the vacuum here. Okay. So if you measure this entanglement via the usual von Neumann entropy for the, dens the, von, Neumann entrop the von Neumann entropy and the usual definition of the, of the density matrix, you get essentially all, this, all this, the same information as what I'm going to tell you. So you don't have to think about spheres. You can just think about the entanglement between different regions in the vacuum. As you know, the vacuum is not an empty, an empty configuration in which nothing happens. There are quantum fluctuations. And you can ask about the correlations between quantum fluctuations here and quantum fluctuations here the entanglement, not the correlation, more precisely the entanglement between quantum fluctuations here and quantum fluctuations here. So you can think about this kind of exotic observable, which is perhaps experimentally measurable. Uh, and uh, in, this, in this way, it leads to some inter theoretically interesting results about the space of quantum field theories. So, so let's start from even dimensions. What I'll be trying to do is to explain what is the content of quantum field theory in, on, on, on the sphere, what does it what kind of questions does it help us answer? And what questions, what new questions it poses? Which new questions it, can, it poses? So let's start from even dimensions. So we put some quantum filter or conformal filter on, a, on, a, on an even dimensional sphere. And you can try to compute the partition function. The partition function is like the grand canonical partition function on the sphere, where you integrate over all the possible quantum fluctuations. Now, without any additional input, this object by itself is not very well defined because you can add what we call a counter term. So different people who compute this grand canonical partition function may not agree because of some divergences. And uh, the divergences can be parameterized with some kind of counter term. So these partition functions are not generally well defined except for some prefactor. So there is a prefactor that depends on the radius of the sphere, which is completely universal and well-defined. It comes with a certain power, a to n, and this is universal. But the, the, the normalization is not universal. OK, so the sphere partition functions contain some piece which is completely universal and some piece which is ambiguous. And we will discuss a lot what this universal piece means physically. But for now, I want to just emphasize that the normalization of the partition function uh, is ambiguous in general. So that's the first observation. Uh, the second observation is that these coefficients that appear in the power here of the radius of the sphere over some arbitrary, arbitrary number to some power, these powers here 
are connected to some uh, interesting observables in flat space that are well known, which are anomalies, certain anomalies. So for example, in the Latinger liquid, you saw that there was this number C, which was equal to 1. So it appears that this power of the radius of the sphere always appears as C over 3, where C is the, the, the central charge in two dimensions, which is 1 in the Latinger liquid. In four dimensions, you find minus 4A, where A is some anomaly in four dimensions. So the radius, the dependence on the radius of the sphere captures an interesting anomaly in flat space, uh, which in the Latinger liquid we can compute exactly. And, uh, and these anomalies will play a very important role in, a, the, in, in what follows. So uh, the power of the radius of the sphere is very interesting, and this is ambiguous. This is the first observation. But now let's discuss odd dimensional systems, like those that appear in many quantum phase transitions in condensed matter systems or statistical physics. So in odd dimensions, if you study the sphere partition function, there are no counter terms. So all the, all, 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 everybody who computes these partition functions would have to agree, because there is, a, there is no freedom in, in adding a counter term. And the three sphere partition function is given by an exponential of minus some number. Okay. And this number is very important. There is a conjecture that this number is always positive. It has not been proven. It's an outstanding great open problem. And uh, this number would appear very, I mean, it would again be very important in what follows. You just have to remember that in odd dimensions there is a number. And in even dimensions there is a certain dependence on the radius of the sphere with some power. But <laughs> this number is very important. There is a conjecture that it's always positive. And this, conjec this conjecture can be proven for topological quantum field theories which are very uh, useful nowadays for uh, various things in condensed matter physics. But in general, we don't have a proof that this number is always positive. This is an outstanding conjecture. This number will end up measuring, in some, in some way, the number of degrees of freedom of quantum field theory, or the number of quantum fluctuations that you can have. And uh, it will foliate the space of theories. So it will play a very important role in geometrizing the space of quantum field theories. OK, so there is this big difference between odd and even dimensions. Now, for the expert, in the case that there is also some supersymmetry, you can say much, much more. So as you remember, without supersymmetry, the prefactor in front of this dependence on the radius of the sphere was an ambigu ambiguous function. Now, if you add supersymmetry, if you throw in supersymmetry to the game, you can prove that, just summarizing a lot of work, uh, that these prefactors are actually geometrically interesting they measure what's called the Keller potential. Let me tell you what's the Keller potential. So now it's completely unambiguous, and it measures the Keller potential in the space of theories. So in two dimensions, it measures the Keller potential with some minus sign, and in four dimensions, with a plus sign, with 1 over 12. Uh, so let me just tell you what is this Keller potential. If you know the Keller potential, you can, from that, compute the metric in the space. So if you just know this, so these partition functions provide you with some information about the metric in the space of theories. And also, the, so they provide you basically with two interesting pieces of information. One is these anomalies that are called A and C. And the other is the metric in the space of theories in the case of supersymmetry. Are there any questions about uh, that? OK, yes? <coughs> Say again? Uh, well, um, you, so, OK, there is some notation here that I haven't been careful in introducing. Uh, so let me tell you. So in the, when I started describing what I'm doing, these were Hermitian operators, and their coefficients were real numbers. But in some cases, it's natural to split this into some operator plus its Hermitian conjugate. And then you can multiply the, the first operator with some complex number and its Hermitian conjugate by the complex conjugate number. So it's sometimes natural to split, to make these couplings into complex numbers, to pair them in some way. And then uh, this is what I've done in that slide. OK. So in some cases, the sphere partition functions, in addition to capturing some interesting anomalies that control the dependence on the radius of the sphere, they allow you to say something about the metric in the space of theories, which is an elusive quantity. But now we know how to measure it with the sphere partition function or with the entanglement entropy. In, in what way can, can you? Oh, that's a great question. That will be the next slide. 
So from the if you, so not so let me just explain what's the question. So the, the partition function is given by e to the power of the Keller potential. Now the Keller potential is not quite the metric. To go from the Keller potential to the metric, you need to take two derivatives, one complex and one anti-complex. So that means that the Keller potential is not well defined. Uh, if you take the Keller potential and shift it by a holomorphic function plus an anti-holomorphic function, it would not change the left-hand side. It would, change the, it would change k, but it would not change the left-hand side. So there is something crazy in what I'm saying, uh, which is that how can the partition function measure k if k is not well defined? So we've been thinking about it for a year. And what we think the resolution is that uh, in all the possible physical models, k must be globally well defined. Okay, and we've been going one by one checking it, and it seems to be true. So it seems that in every possible, the geometry of quantum filters is such that k always exists. That a, that's a very severe topological restriction on the space, but we've been going over examples, and it seems to be true. So we claim that k is globally defined. Otherwise, the partition function would not be a function. It would transform in some way under some transformations that are not physical. It would be a section in some mathematician's terminology. So we, the partition function cannot be a, f a section, it's a function. So unless, yeah, unless, unless k is globally defined, that leads to contradictions. Now, mathematically, what it means is that some class, some cohomology class of the manifold must vanish. So in particular, the space of quantum filters cannot be compact. So you can really prove that without any computation almost. You just, you can prove that the space of quantum filters, if you start deforming and you start measuring distances, it cannot be a sphere. It has to be a non-compact space, otherwise you would run into contradictions. But even if it's topologically trivial in this sense, I mean, what, you can still have local gauge transformations. How do you determine k in that transform? Yeah, you're, you're, uh, I'll be extremely happy to discuss uh, how we, what's the reasoning that leads to this conclusion. I was a little bit, you know, uh, brief about it, but I, I don't want to get into details. I think it will be too much. I'll be very happy to explain what reasoning, what precisely reasoning leads to this conclusion. But basically, it's that the requirement that the partition function cannot be a section fundamentally. It's a function. So the, so this line bundle must be trivial. This, this is sometimes called the beggar witten line bundle. Or, in, or the Hodge bundle, and we claim that it must be trivial. Okay, so um, you can just go over examples and check that this is true. One of the more, more fascinating applications of this idea is for Calabi Yau sigma models, which is an example that I mentioned in the beginning. So we claim that uh, all the Calabi Yau mo moduli spaces have to have trivial Keller class, so K has to be globally defined, and it seems that this is true. At least as far as we could see, this is true. You can also check that this is true for these examples with the comp with the Luttinger liquid or n equals four. You can verify that this is true. You can also verify that this is true in all the other known examples. Uh, and one can come up with pretty explicit expressions for these sphere partition functions for many many interesting theories and just check. Uh, it, it seems to be true. So one can reach some interesting conclusion that this space cannot be compact just by some you know <laughs> theoretical considerations. I'll skip that. Okay, so now I'm, uh, I'm done with supersymmetry. I want to go back to the space of quantum filters and to these anomalies. Uh, are there any questions about that, about what I just said? Okay, so let's go back to the space of quantum filters forgetting about supersymmetry. So the general picture in quantum filters is that we start from some conformal filter, and now I'm allowing beta to be non-zero. So I'm allowing some evolution as the microscope changes, and we have some kind of evolution to another conformal filter. So the general Wilsonian picture that Joe mentioned in the beginning is that you have some conformal filter when the microscope is a, of utmost power, and then there is some evolution, and then you get some other conformal filter when the microscope is very, very weak. That's the general picture that we inherited from Wilson. And uh, this is just one line. For example, I showed previously these kind of diagrams. So. Uh, this is just like one of those lines, okay? So there are many RG, there are many flows of that sort, and they can be very complicated. Okay. So let's try to see what the partition function tells us about such flows. So now the partition function 
does not necessarily depend in a simple fashion on the radius of the sphere, because now the theory is not conformal. So there is another scale in the problem which characterizes the flow itself. So the, generally, the partition function is a very complicated function. But if you take the sphere to be very small or very large, it simplifies a lot, because it's only sensitive to the conformal filter that describes the short distances and the conformal filter that describes the long distances. And in this case, we can say that this exponent, the exponent here, f, in two dimensions would go to a logarithm that with a coefficient that depends on the central charge, what, which was 1 for Lattinger liquid. In four dimensions, it would go to some other logarithm with some other coefficient that depends on this anomaly a. And in three dimensions, there would be no logarithm, but it would go to some number, a pure number that is called little f. So we don't know, in general, the partition functions when you have complicated evolutions between two conformal field theories, but we know they're asymptotics, which are logarithmic functions with some coefficients or some constant, depending on the number of dimensions. OK, so this is what we know. Now, there appears to be a very universal and surprising result, which is that in all the known examples, these coefficients satisfy these inequalities. So the space of theory seems to be foliated. There is some characteristic number. of each, For each conformal field theory, there seems to be some characteristic number that when you find this number, all the other conformal field theories that can be reached by, it, by you know, the formations of the sort that I've been discussing must have a characteristic number that is smaller. So if you just start from a given point and you start deforming around it, you can only reach other points in which these numbers are lower. And you can never go back. OK, you can never go back. There is this space of theories is foliated by these numbers C, F, and A. So the space of theories, so what did we learn? We learned, one, the space of theories has a natural metric. The metric is called the Zamalochik of metric. It's given by these two-point functions, gamma ij, about which I told you some things for supersymmetric theories. The second thing that we've just learned is that the space is foliated. So we, the space looks like some, uh, I'll, I'll have some pictures later, but the space has some natural foliation and the natural metric. So um, we, we can say a little bit more. For example, in two dimensions, it has been proven that it's not just a foliated space with some natural metric, but in fact, the space admits a gradient, gradient flow. What is a gradient flow? It means that these vector fields that take you down the, the stream uh, are given by derivatives of some potential function. Okay, So when you deform around your initial point, you go to some point where the characteristic numbers C, F, and A are smaller. But the, there is an, a mathematical question of whether this kind of evolution is a gradient evolution, whether you always go down the stream in a, like a gradient flow. This is known in two dimensions, but it's not known to be true in three dimensions, and it's not known whether it's true in four dimensions. It's an important, one of the most important open course open questions about the space of quantum filters. Is it a gradient flow or not? This is something that can be settled by computations, but nobody has managed to do it yet. So these inequalities appear to be another interesting and tantalizing thing that has emerged is that these inequalities, which look kind of surprising, they seem to be appear they seem they appear to be related to some famous inequalities in information theory, which is another very confusing piece of data that we've got about the space of theories. So let me tell you what kind of information theory comes in. So in information theory, there is a very nice result that is called the subadditivity inequality. It's, a, it's, it's one of the fundamental results in the theory of information, which appears to be mathematically equivalent to these inequalities that I've mentioned, although it has not been proven. There are just some suggestions that there might be some relation. So let me just re t tell you what this inequality is. So you take three vector spaces, or Hilbert spaces, doesn't matter. You form a tensor product. And you just, you just assume that there is some density matrix in these three spaces. The density matrix is just a semi-positive definite matrix with a unit trace. So one can, define, one can define reduced matrices by tracing over one of those subspaces. So if you have a matrix with three types of indices, one, two, and three, you can trace over three by tracing over that vector space. So you can define row 1, 2, row 1, row 2, 3, and so on and so forth by tracing over these components. Then you can define what's called the von Neumann entropy. So given any matrix, you just take minus the trace of the matrix times the logarithm of the matrix. And this is well defined because rho is semi-positive definite, so you never encounter negative eigenvalues. Okay? So this 
kind of combination satisfies this inequality. It's just a statement in linear algebra in the end of the day. You can think about these spaces as finite dimensional. This is just a statement about matrices. But this is one of the most fundamental inequalities in information theory. And in fact, surprisingly, there is no simple proof for this. There is no known simple proof for this inequality. It's something that would be, I think, of great value if somebody finds an intuitive proof for this inequality. But there doesn't exist one. If you look at the proofs, they're extremely ugly manipulations with logarithms of matrices. Well, then there are also many other inequalities which are not generally correct. Yeah, but in ADS-CFT, this inequality can be mapped to some simple geometric picture about minimal surfaces, but that induces also lots of other inequalities that are not generally correct. OK, if, I, I think it would be an interesting exercise to try to find uh, an intuitively appealing proof of this fundamental result. OK, so there is a claim. Oh, that's what I said. There is a claim that these inequalities are somehow fundamentally related to the foliation of the space of quantum field theories. And the connection is through entanglement entropy. These sphere partition functions, as I told you in the beginning, these sphere partition functions are uh, physically the same as some entanglement in the vacuum of quantum field theory. And this entanglement satisfies some inequalities. And one can formally manip manipulate these inequalities so to form, to, to have, uh, uh, one can formally manipulate this, uh, sub this strong inequality of information theory and arrive at these inequalities for A, C, and F. This has not been done really. It has only been done in this case, and it's more complicated in this case. And for this case, it has not been done at all. But there is some suggestion that that might be true. So this defoliation of quantum fields might be related to some inequalities in information theory about uh, the entanglement between different regions in the vacuum. Uh, it remains to be seen whether this will pan out and whether this will shed light on this question of gradient flow. Okay. So these are interesting open questions for the future. These are some very concrete open questions that can be settled. And they're just a matter of computation. So let me just uh, summarize the main point. So the space of theories has a natural geometry. It's a space with a metric. Uh, sometimes, uh, well, it's a space of a, with a metric. Sometimes in supersymmetric theories, you can say much more. You can say global things about the space. For example, you can prove that it's a non-compact space using the tools that I've mentioned. Or you can prove that some train classes vanish. Now, the space of quantum field theories, in addition to being a geometric space, has a natural foliation. So you can never go up the stream. You can only go down the stream. Like, there is some notion of time, if you want. This is like a time direction. You only go forward in time. You can never go backwards in time. So there is like a time direction in the space of conformal field, in the space of quantum filters. And that's an interesting fact. I don't know if this time direction will be related to more deep uh, ideas about the emergence of space and time in the future, but it might. Uh, <clears throat> there might even be a gradient flow structure. Uh, it has been shown in two dimensions, but it remains to be proven or disproven in higher dimensions. And the sphere partition function appears to be a central player in these ideas about the space of quantum filters. It can teach you global properties of the, about foliations and compactness. And it can also be used in some supersymmetric theory to actually measure the geometry, the local geometry of the space. And there is an intriguing relation to some fundamental inequalities about entanglement entropy that are pivotal in information theory. But so far, the suggestion is kind of loose, but very intriguing. So these are the main points that I wanted to cover. Thanks. Okay, we have a lot of time for questions. Oh, 10 minutes. So, why not consider the partition function and other surfaces? Um, so uh, there is a sort of a technical answer. So it's natural to start from conformal field theories. And uh, if you study the partition function in non-compact space, there are infrared divergences, because the volume is infinite. So you want a space that would be conformally equivalent, like this is the stereographic map. You want a space that would preserve angles, which would be natural in conformal field theories, but it would be compact at the same time. I don't think that there is any other space than the sphere. I think that the sphere is the only compact manifold which is globally conformally flat. Yes. Uh, you mentioned early on that the number of relevant uh, coupling constants are somehow bounded 
by the other characteristic of the cloud VM manifold. That seems very surprising. Could you at least sketch how that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I, I even yeah, the, the slides even contain enough information to explain why that is true. So there is this uh, paragraph that I said very quickly. Uh, so what what does this paragraph say? So if it, if you start from a two comma two supersymmetric theory in two dimensions, mm -hmm. and you study all the possible marginal deformations, they're in one to one correspondence with deformations of Calabi-Yau spaces. So why is that? Okay, so we start from sigma model on a Calabi-Yau manifold. Okay, we start from some fields which which whose whose uh, uh, targets target spaces some Calabi-Yau manifold. Now the marginal operators correspond to the formations of the Keller structure of the Calabi-Yau manifold or the complex structure of the Calabi-Yau manifold. Okay, that's a that's that that's that's a claim. I'm not going to prove it now. So the space of exactly marginal operators is in one-to-one -one correspondence with Keller deformations and complex structure deformations of the Calabi-Yau manifold. Okay, and the number of complex structure deformations and Keller deformations for Calabi-Yau manifolds is captured by the Hodge diamond. So it's captured by some uh, HPQ indices, which enter the other characteristic. So if you could find an example in which the number of exactly marginal parameters were infinite, that would be enough to show that uh, uh, that there are some uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds with infinitely many deformations. Yes. Yes, I agree. This is a fine, but well, this can be ruled out with a little bit more work. I, I can tell you which more. You can rule it out with a little bit more work. Mm. Yes. So there is a there is a connection between the Hodge diamond of Calabi-Yau manifolds and exactly marginal deformations of two two theories. And I don't. I think that mo many mathematicians believe that it's bounded from above. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. This is what many mathematicians believe. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it would be very nice to prove it. It's a, it's a it's a concrete quantum field theory exercise to prove it. So, so it could be nice <laughs> if that could be done. Yao had to prove. It's Yao who sort of proved the geometric version and told that's not, not easy. Proof. Oh, sorry. Not the, the, the right. But what he did, what is proven is proven by Yao, right? I mean, that's yeah, but there's no bound. No bound, no. Just the, con the connection between the CFT and the connection the is a, actually just. I think the connection the, is. The representation theory of yeah, yeah, the connection is trivial. Uh, uh, the connection is trivial. Yes? Are there any tools to study the, uh, the triple space of theories for non supersymmetric theories? Because it sounds like the sphere partition function won't do it. You're, you're right. For non-supersymmetric theories, the sphere partition function only captures these anomalies, and not the metric. Uh, so you're asking, you, so keep in mind that exactly margin, okay, <coughs> what should I say? It's a formidably hard problem, on which I can give you only very partial and uh, unsatisfactory answers. But keep in mind that without supersymmetry, at least exactly marginal operators are extremely unlikely. They only appear in the Slatinger li liquid and Ashkin Teller models. And in those cases, it's exactly computable. The metric is exactly computable. It's given by the metric on the upper half plane that Poincaré invented. So in this very restricted sense, uh, you can do it. But if you want to really study the metric for non-conformal field theories, like in actual RG flows, uh, you cannot say much, even in two dimensional. R there are some integrable flows in two dimensions, for example, from a, a C equals 3 fifths to three, C equals a half, those flows are sort of integrable and you can maybe compute it. But other than that, I don't think one can make much progress nowadays. A question. You mentioned how hard it is to prove strong subadditivity, and I, I admit that I've used this result without ever studying the proof. Yes. It's pretty trivial if you assume the state is a product of bell pairs. Does, yes. does, do you know if the general proof uses this idea at all? Or, or is it well, uh, no, it does not. But um, there is a, a, a reformulation of this inequality with, for rel what's called relative entropy. Uh, yes. And that reformulation introduces two independent density matrices in the total space. And I was thinking that that's the most natural point to start, because that sounds a little bit like Keldish's formalism. Mm -hmm. 
So the inequality reminds a little bit of some ideas about Wilsonian renormalization. So in that reformulation of this inequality, what the statement is that some relative entropy is monotonically decreasing, and that's it, oh. as you increase some space. So it sounds a lot like uh, some starting some kind of dissipative uh, version of Wilsonian's formalism. But yeah, otherwise it's just a mess. It's been done, I think, 40 years ago by Lieb and Lieb and whom? Uh, Ruskai, Lieb and Ruskai, yeah. Well, I personally don't really believe there is gradient flow. I believe there is another structure, but not a gradient flow. A gradient flow has like two indices. I believe there is a. I believe in four dimensions there is a slight generalization of the notion of gradient flow with four indices. But I haven't proven that. This is what I believe is true. But it's still rules out the, the what? The generalized version of gradient flow rules out the recycling. Well, I think that's rule. This is a bit of science fiction, these limit cycles. <laughs> yeah, this is a little bit science fiction. Well, I don't know. I, uh, many people have some very strong opinions and feelings for these things, and I don't want to say bad things about limit cycles. <laughs> yeah, but it, for me, it's a little bit like science fiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Thank you again. Thanks.